open up to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. And this is the end of Paul's first missionary journey. He was sent out of Antioch. The Holy Spirit of God called those men. He commissioned them. The church sent them, uh, blessed them, prayed for them, was concerned and worried about them. And then they, uh, it says in verse 26, uh, <clears throat> and thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. Now, you know, folks, I, I wish that I could say it's fulfilled. You know, I just really deep down, I know that our work is not done. If it was, I, I would say I'm done over there and we would just be happy to stay here with you <laughs> with English <laughs> and electricity. Anyway, which they fulfilled, and when they had, were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles, and there they abode long time with the, gen, with, with the disciples. And, and then in another passage, they kind of did the same thing, and it said there was rejoicing in the church. Amen. And so this morning, if you would, uh, we would just use this as a spring text for what is to come. I'd like to rehearse all that God has done up to this point and uh, in answer to your prayers, to your giving, to your sacrifices, and then maybe uh, help understand, you know, what's ahead in the future. So with that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your... Lord, it is just good to be any place, Lord, where you're... There is just... We can feel your presence and... Um, Lord, any time you're around, Lord, we, um, it's just everything is okay, and everything's right, and Lord, you make everything right, and Lord, we just thank you for blessing the service. Thank you for the reminders of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for this church, for the pastor, for his wife, for the men and the people here. I pray that you'll just keep this, uh, this place strong in you and in your word, and God, continue to use, bless, answer the prayers, and Lord, I just pray that you would open up our eyes and help us to see some things this morning. Uh, what you see, um, Lord, every day, and help us to know uh, what you'd have us to do. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would be seated, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring this up. There we go. Uh, if it's okay, I'll stand off to the side. And uh, I'd like to say a couple of things. So we were on our way. We were finishing up our furlough. Yeah, thank you. That would be great. Turn the lights down a little bit, be a little bit more visible. So we were uh, finishing up uh, a furlough and uh, really excited at what God has done, you know, while we were here, really ready to go back. And then the war happened. Uh, I felt like a caged lion was that first couple of days, not really sure what to do, what, what was going to happen in the future. Uh, I knew that if Russia took our territory that missions, the door to missions would be closed. And I was very confused, really, because up to that point, God had answered all these prayers and the burden is still there, you know. Uh, I really do believe that God has work for us to do there. And so um, a couple of people called uh, a real old, old prayer warrior of a saint, Hattie Crane from North Carolina. I mean, she literally gets up she says that she has for decades, before she has coffee, before she has anything, she gets up every day, 5 o'clock, she reads her Bible and communes with Jesus Christ every day for an hour before she does anything. She's a real prayer warrior, all right? So she calls me out of the blue. I haven't talked to her in like 25 years. And she said, the Holy Spirit of God just touched me this morning and told me to call you and tell you, Brother Rue, keep going. Amen. Just keep going. <laughs> and then... Uh, so the body of Christ is just very sweet. Dr. Peacock called me out of the blue. I didn't call him. He called me and he said, you know, Brother Rue, I just really don't, I just want to encourage you, don't go back <laughs> right now. He said, just don't go back. Um, he said, you know, I learned something with the police that the guy back in the trailer calling the shots, organizing everything is just as important to the guys that are breaking down the door. And he said, if, if you think of me, just think of me as the guy in your corner holding your, the spit bucket while you duke it out, you know. So you just come over and spit in the buck anytime you want, <laughs> and I'm holding it for you. And I really appreciated little things like that. And so a bunch of money started coming in, and we began to ask the questions, how are we going to use this money for the glory of God, for the, you know, for the furtherance of the gospel? 
And we at first had four um, locations, four men through, through which we could get aid. And uh, these were trusted sources. These were men who were proven. And we wanted to use this as a way to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it finally kind of dwindled down to maybe two locations. Uh, one was in our, our home church. And our, the refugees were flooding in from, uh, you know, Crimea, from Nikolaev, um, from Donetsk region. They were all coming from the southern regions, and they were uh, coming to, our, to ours. And so we were ministering locally. Then uh, we had uh, other different men who were starting to take trips out to um, eastern Ukraine. And that's what uh, Brother Olosha, he said, the need out there is the greatest. Because we looked at the western border... Uh, over here in Ukraine, all this western border here was, um, I mean, all the big named, very, very rich groups were already there in the western border. And, uh, but nobody was really going right where the war was just a couple of miles away, where the need was the greatest. There was, of course, some trepidation, some fear, trembling, and some serious, um, you know, risk, but we felt like that's what the Lord wanted us to do. So, um, we were sending money over there, and our guys were reporting back, and we were communicating and directing and doing all that stuff. And then they said, you know, Pastor, you need to come here. You need to see this. We want you to see so you can tell the churches how their money is being used. And so I went over last year, and then I went over again, just got back the day, that night uh, of Easter Sunday. And I uh, wanted to just kind of give you a, a, a lay of the ground. I'm a, I'm a map geek. I like geography a lot, so I'll try, I'll try not to geek out too much. But um, you can't fly into Ukraine. All the airspace is closed, of course. The, air, the airports are all closed. So we, we prayed about which way to go, and we decided to go through Moldova. Uh, you can fly into the capital of Moldova, which is Chisinau. I've always known it as, in the Russian language as Kishinev. And uh, that's where Paul Hamilton is, and he was able to help get me uh, you know, to where we needed to go. So this is a very important map because very few Americans know what this situation is right here. This is in a region, this grayed out shaded region is Transnistria or Prednistrovia. This is Transnistria and this is the capital, that's Tiraspol. And so whenever I was there in 1992, this is 32, 34 years ago, whatever it was, uh, the, the Soviet Union d was dissolved. They, were, they agreed that all of the boundaries of all the republics would stay the same, but of course Russia does not abide by that. They wanted to keep control of certain, uh, you know, some passageways. And so one of the first, the very, very first war that began, began in Moldova in this corridor right here that would give Putin, or give at the time, you know, Boris Yeltsin, would give the Kremlin power to control all of, you know, this area there's a lot of transportation that goes around here. And there is a huge cache of weapons right there. Huge. I've got a friend who actually saw the underground bunker. He said that thing is endless. If that thing blew, it would blow everything from here to Kishinev. It would just, it is huge. And so the Soviets had stockpiled an amazing amount of um, weaponry and hardware right there. And uh, so this grayed out area, I was told that, you know, that Russia's 14th Army is there. I've heard 10,000 men, I've heard five, I've heard seven, I've heard three, I've heard 1,200. And it's always a concern for me because people in America have been like, you know, Brother Ru, you know, Brother so-and-so, he's over there right now. Why aren't you over there right now? And I'm like, well, Brother so-and-so, you know, he's way up north. He can be in one hour, less than an hour. He can be in Poland, which is a NATO country. That's not my situation. Okay, it's one thing to have rocket fire and drones and missiles. It's quite another thing whenever Russian boots come down your street clearing houses, yeah. calling you out on the street, and I've just seen what they did to people in Ossetia in Georgia and how they just murdered people. I mean, I, 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 it's some of the things that I could never unsee, but these were videos that were smuggled out by the Russian military and what they did and things I heard, and it's just, it was terrible. It was awful. That was very fresh in my mind, and why this is important for you is, you see where it says Tiraspol, you see the A and the S, and that little leg right there. Well, here's Kishinev, here's Tiraspol, and there's that little leg, and there's my house. <laughs> <laughs> so if I go down here to this road and hit this T right here, now we've evangelized all this area. We've been in all these little white areas, those are all villages and towns. We've been through all of this area. But if you get to that T, you can practically be at my house in 10 minutes. 
That's a little close when a Russian, Russia's 14th Army is that just that close to your house. Yeah. Now, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go back and get some reconnaissance, and I was able to get some information on both sides of uh, Prednestrovia. So I asked, uh, you know, Brother um, uh, Paul Hamilton's guy up there in Kishinev, and he was Vanya. He's a, he's a great guy. He's a great translator. He's like, oh, those guys there. He says, they're not fighters. You know, they're, they're just truck drivers and paper pushers and mechanics. They're not fighters. He says, we go over there, and they are scared to death of the Ukrainian army. So they're all paralyzed, so I'm not really worried. And then I, over here, we had a guy in our church, and I said, hey, brother, uh, if you were me and you had a family, and he's an officer and he does all kinds of stuff, I said, what would you do? I said, would you go to Ismail down here and well, further down in Ismail? He said, don't go to Ismail. I said, would you go to Odessa? He said, don't go to Odessa. I said, what about, you know, Razdel? He said, yeah, stay. this is safe. I said, what about Prednestrovia? He said, ah, don't worry about it. He said, they got this, but we got this, 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 and this. <laughs> and he told me hey, everything that they've got there on the border. And I was like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> so that helped. This last trip really did help a lot. So this is the occupied territory. The Russian army had pushed all the way up to Mikolaev. Uh, here's Kherson. This is where Casey Klein was, just a little bit north of Kherson. But the Russian army got all the way to Mikolaev, but was pushed back. Uh, one translator, this was an outlet that we had with um, uh, humanitarian aid and stuff, Brother Oleg, who translates a lot of material for us. He's there right now taking care of his family. And then we had, of course, um, Odessa and then up, up, up north. But uh, this is troop locations. The red is the Russians. You can see Tiraspol right there. That's two of their armies. And then there's another, another two up further north. And then this is a map that shows. So we had to fly in there, go all the way around. We had to go all the way down, circle around, and come back up because of Transnistria. And then uh, we had some time with the church, had a great, great meeting with them, and we, I'll talk about that in a minute, but we had to get on this road and take it all the way to Mikolaev, through Mikolaev, and then we based here in Snegorivka, and then we ministered everything here in the Russian armies, of course, over there. Here's again, um, Snegorivka, where are we at? So, yeah, Snegorivka is right here. This is the river, and then uh, the war is going on right here. It's really hot and crinky right now. That's a miracle. Amen. That's what's left of our church. The last time I was there, uh, that was, this was my first visit. The last time I was there, I counted like 50 people are gone. And most of them are in Europe. They're in Germany. There's some in Poland, in Italy, Canada, um, the United States, but they're everywhere. But this is what's left. And praise God that they're there and they're ministering, winning souls. We were able to lay hands finally on Brother Alosha. He stepped up to bat. He, his, his uh, son was born. There was problems with the, with, the, with the birth. There was lack of oxygen. His son is mentally handicapped. This has been a, a burden. This has been one of his, the cross that he has to bear. And he was always asking, why, Lord? Why? Why did this happen? And today, he's exempt from the war because of that. He's able to lead that church and that ministry right now because of that. And things began to make sense to him. So amen. It was just a blessing. It was a great testimony. And then uh, we had a great dinner on the grounds, the ord ordination service. And then the following day, we got up at 5 o'clock in the morning when uh, you know, curfew ends at 5. It, it's from 11 to 5 at night. You, you are not allowed out on the streets during that time. And then we drove through Mikolaev. Snap this picture because, you know, there's kids out on the playgrounds during air raid sirens. And the locals, you can see the boarded up houses. That's because of the shrapnel that, you know, whenever the anti-missile systems take out a, a missile or a drone, still there's just shrapnel that goes everywhere. And it, you know, busted everybody's windows. But look at this. The people themselves made a bunker for their kids so that whenever the air raid sirens, their kids have some place to go. Now, you got any problems? Yeah. Pictures like this are just redundant out there where the Russians used to be. We were traveling down this road, and our guy said, this is all newly paved road from uh, you know, the money that the United States has, has given. He said, when we were here before, it was all bombed out. There was military hardware. There was all bombed out. He said, there was even body parts. 
that they hadn't yet cleaned up. There was mines everywhere, and he said, all of this is newly paved. So the Lord provided, you guys helped, and we were able to get 1,200 of these boxes, and they're about the size of, a little bit bigger than a box of Chick Tracks, and it had food in it, everything that people would need to cook their own food, to make it stretch, and uh, so it had, you know, canned meat, and it had some pasta, and rice, and oatmeal, and it had uh, oil and flour, but it had the gospel, and it had literature in it, and they even ordered special tape that says, God loves you on it. <laughs> Amen. We got 1,200. It's like we moved the, each time over 8,000 uh, or eight, eight tons, eight tons of, of aid and food, and not including literature, but it was just that stuff was like eight tons. And every box had to be loaded several times by hand, <laughs> which was fun. And then uh, we stored it here at this guy's. He's left his house, and we were able to use that. Uh, this, this is a ministry where they bake 600 loaves of bread in two days in wood stoves. 600. Can you believe that? So, you know, ladies, uh, if you've got a good kitchen, Brother, brother you know, Elliot, Pastor Elliot's done real good with that kitchen back there. You ought to thank God every day. Amen? <laughs> you don't have to make it with a wood, with, you know, wood and all that kind of stuff. But we loaded that up and um, started working with the local magistrates through word of mouth through um, Brother Ilchenko. Now, he is a, uh, a, a national that we started supporting back in... That's him right there. We started supporting him <clears throat> years ago. He was led to Christ by Dr. Charles Manus from Columbus, Ohio, up in Jetomir. And that's, he got a lot of real good you know, training and soul winning. And I met him at Perry Demopolis. Uh, Perry had me come up and preach a Bible conference. And I was up there, and I preached on living on by faith and telling them anecdotes and stories of how God miraculously answered our prayers and provision and guidance and all these things, and it was exciting. And he came up to me afterwards and said, Brother, I want that. I want that life. I want to see God really do something. I said, Well, brother, go do it. <laughs> go get it. And so he had the idea of taking the gospel to every major city in Ukraine and so he set out on one summer, and then one time he did it on a bicycle. Could you imagine going to every major city in the, in the state of Texas, riding a bike from city to city? And so what we... Let that sink in for just a minute, okay? And don't tell me how hard you got it. So anyway, that's what he wanted to do, and he would call me up. Because he, he loves our church. He said, the spirit in your church is just amazing, and we really want to, we want missionaries to come around. And so when we have a guy coming, if I know for like a month in advance, our people are poor, but we want to give them a love offering that's like, we, we save sometimes for months so that we can give them a good love offering. And so as a result, these guys come around. <laughs> one, one, one of our church members was like, you know, pastor. These missionaries, these preachers are coming around here like honey, like, like bees on honey. I said, that's exactly what we want because <laughs> they stir up people, you know. You ought to hang around missionaries a little bit. Amen. Listen to their stories. Amen. <laughs> get you fired up a little bit. Or, 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 the reason why some people don't is because they get under conviction. <laughs> but anyway, we want them hanging around. So he started hanging around and he would call and he would kind of. You know, he never want, want to ask for help, but he would say, you know, we need more literature. Get us some literature. And, of course, we'd always send him, you know, a couple hundred bucks here, 500 bucks there, you know, and just keep him going. And what the Lord was doing for like two years before the war is he made contacts with people all over there. And so when the war started, he called and said, where's the greatest need? Because that's what we wanted to know. Where's the greatest need? We want to go there. So he made contact, and we were able to work with the local magistrates. And we drove up to this town right here, and the people were already waiting for us. We drove up. He opened up in Ukrainian. I preached the gospel in Russian, gave an invitation, and 10 people came out. Amen. I was a little bit shocked. I'm, I, he snapped this picture. I'm not big on pictures, but he snapped a picture while we were praying, and they were getting saved. I'm against easy believism. I'm really used to dealing with one person at a time, but it was amazing. Amen. Passed out aid, and you know, they, they wanted to take pictures and stuff. Went to another town. 
This lady right here was the magistrate. You can see the houses were bombed out. These are UN tents where they put a generator where people can keep warm in the winter. They can go there, charge their phones, get warm, and then they go back to their houses. And that's how they survive winter. There's no heat. There's no electricity. Preach the gospel there. I have never seen 30 people respond to an invitation at one time. I mean, most of the crowd just kind of came out, and I, I just, I, there was a lot of conf conflict inside, you know, with how to handle this. But it back, in the back of my mind, I know we preached the gospel. It was clear what it was, what it's not. It's not a, this vague, you know, accept Jesus in your life. It, folks, I preached the gospel to them. I gave a clear invitation. I mean, afterwards, I was like, do you understand that, you know, this is not an invitation to just get humanitarian aid? They were like, yes. I said, you, you understand this is for you to receive Jesus? Yes, yes. And they said, uh, I said, do you have any questions? They said, how could we have any questions with you explained it so well? I said, so, you, you know, really, I was the one that was in, <laughs> standing in the way. And so finally they prayed. Because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking these people could be dead in a, in a month. What would you do? You know? Then we went to this town, Blagadatnaya, which means grace, by the way. Grace. They were hit hard. This is a school. This is a great picture of Russian liberation. They're trying to liberate Ukraine. This is how they do it. This place is just decimated. And people are there trying to pick up the pieces and put their lives back together and their homes back together. There wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of people there. There's just this small crowd. But five of them received Christ. This lady right here, she was like, thank you for the aid. I don't want to sound unthankful, but winter's coming. Is there any way your organization can help us with maybe some lumber to put a roof over our heads before winter? I felt about that tall. And I told him, I said, you know, silver and gold have I none. You're saved now. You're God's child now. Somehow God's going to get you through this. And then my last trip, there she was. God got her through. Preached the gospel there, another town and village. We were in a different one. We went from morning to night, preaching to crowds that were already, you know, assembled before we got there, preaching the gospel, giving invitations, leading people to Christ, giving them bread, giving them aid. Went to, uh, this was a, a, a church. This was, a, this was a, um, an abandoned church Christ. And if they want to abandon it, then I'll use it. Amen. <laughs> And so we got in there, and again, we preached there for about two hours because we had to take two trips. We only had this little Volkswagen van to move everything, and so and everything has to be moved by hand. And so there was a lot of time. So we, I, I was there, and I preached, and Brother uh, Sasha was there, and he preached. We preached for about two hours to these folks, gave an invitation, and uh, we had to load up the, the van. The, Brother Casey Klein and Brother Alosha did all the loading and unloading. But um, Brother Sasha snapped this picture during the invitation, and some people believed and some people didn't. Some people said, you know, we're here later. I know this, folks. I remember feeling the Lord there, just like I felt him here this morning. How many people got saved, I have no idea. But I know people were praying. I saw some dry, I, I saw some uh, tears, people wiping their eyes. I mean, look at their faces. Look at that. That little girl. And then teenagers will be teenagers <laughs> taking selfies. That was funny. We went here to Snigorivka. This was probably the closest point to the war. This was underwater at one, uh, earlier when they bombed that Novokokovka dam. Uh, it flooded the entire area. We showed up. There was a big crowd. We also had to make you know, several trips to get the boxes. And this was during the, um, you know, we were just trying to preach and take advantage of our time there. And so right about here, I'm preaching the gospel and I'm explaining it, what it is, what it's not, what Jesus Christ has done for them and how, you know, just everything about the blood atonement and how they can have peace with God through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, just giving it all to him. Amen. And right in the middle of all of that, I heard a boom. That was the second time that, you know, something really close, a big explosion. And I, and I thought, oh no, the meeting is over. And, you know, I just thought that would be it. You see how they're standing there, just kind of like this. This is how they do. And that boom, explosion, and they just went, went right back to listening. <laughs> I thought that was great. They don't panic anymore. They've come to the conclusion that if it's your time to go, you're going to go. 
not a whole lot you can do. You know, why live your life just constant, run into the, the bomb shelters? So that's what they do. So had a great time. There was a couple of folks there that got saved, and, and we had a good time. I'll tell, talk a little bit more about this place a little bit later. Then we went back for this, last, um, this past spring there in March, and this time we were able to get 5,000 of these packages of rice with meat and dehydrated meat and dehydrated vegetables in it. Again, another 1,200 boxes, same thing, full, you know, full of stuff and literature. And the same ladies made another 600 loaves of bread. <laughs> Amen. And then our little Volkswagen, our 2008 Volkswagen van, took out all the seats, <laughs> loaded that thing up multiple times. That little lady there, she, she really, I got a kick out of her. I, I don't remember her name. She told me her name, but I don't remember it. But she's an obvious, she's a Bulgarian. You, I can tell who's a Bulgarian, who's a Romanian, you know, who's a Russian. They all, you can tell them from a mile away. And who's American? <laughs> I can tell Americans or Europeans, you can, they, they stand out. Pol, Poles, Polacks, they stand out too. But she's obviously, she's uh, from, you know, Bulgaria or her parents were from Bulgaria. And she's about, you know, five foot tall or something like that, little skinny thing. And those sacks of bread, those burlap sacks of bread, I mean, that was once flour, okay? A sack of flour kind of weighs a lot. And so that bread is really, it's not wonder bread, folks. This is like the old wheat, like wheat used to be before we changed it, you know. So anyway, <clears throat> so we're in the rain and we're moving all these burlap sacks of bread and we got one in each arm and we're going back and forth. And about that time, that sister, she picks up two. <laughs> a little thing, you know, she just, like it's nothing. And so she put us all to shame and we had to pick up, step it up a little bit. <laughs> You're like, okay, man, let's get this thing going here. She was fun. And got to preach in Yurivka, the gospel. They were, those folks were out there waiting for like four hours because our van broke down. And I'll tell a little bit about that. And this was where we were one night. And about this point, they had been waiting for us for hours and hours. And we finally got there. Most of the crowd dispersed. So we went back the following day. But while I was preaching there, uh, you could see the horizon. And we're about, I don't know, five, ten miles away from the war and it's just the sky just lighting up. You can hear, it's like thunder. <laughs> and you can hear the ground still. You feel, you feel the vibration. You hear the sounds. It feels and, and, and sounds and looks a lot like just thunder. But the war is raging over there. And these people live in that day in and day out. That's, you know, we see a lot of nervous tics, PTSD. You know, there's a lot of this you see on the side of the roads and in towns and villages. We went to Nova Petrivka this time. This was a new one. That sister, I showed up and I was saying, you know, hello in Russian. I was speaking Russian. And she says, do you mind if we speak Ukrainian? I said, I'm from Odessa. I'm an American. I've been in Ukraine ever since 1992. They taught me Russian when I came here. I'm from Odessa. Is that a problem? She said, no, it's not a problem. But she started to cry. She said, I want you to know, we paid a price to speak our language here. And uh, come to find out, her husband, along with 20 other men in their town, they were captured by the Russians and tortured to death over like three days. And she had to go get his body. So I'm going to ask you again, you got any problems? Can you maybe take a moment to, everything's not about you? And think that this is daily over there right now. That lady, she's not even saved, but she organized the biggest meeting we've ever had. There was like 350 people in there. This was the outside of the hall. A firefight had taken place. You can see that somebody took a machine gun and sprayed and chased somebody into the building. You can see the, the bullet holes are all along the sides of the walls. This is the, the windows. We held the meeting in here. You can see the bullet holes and stuff like that. They're there, they're there, they're there, here, there. I don't know what happened in that. You can see it was all shot up in this backdrop. This was the stage. We preached the gospel to these folks and gave an invitation. And like, I didn't count because it was huge. But the one brother that was with me from Cincinnati, 
He said, I counted at least 50 people up there. Now, I get culture shock. I, I, I left this Amen. and went down to the Jubilee. I'm just kind of standing there in the Jubilee, just like, where am I at? What's going on? <laughs> it's just different, you know. Um, I've never seen it quite like this. I've, it was like this in the 1990s, and I always longed for the 1990s when people get saved. I, you could expect that there would always be visitors in church and that someone was going to get saved every Sunday. And then about the year 2000, it stopped, and it was just a dearth. It was, it was just gleanings, one here, one there, one every four, every six months or something like that. And I always longed for the days where you could preach the gospel and people would get saved, and God did it. When's the last time you saw crowds like that for literature? That was all the literature. So I want to... Could you imagine living with this every day? These are air raid sirens. This means something is in your area. Kids playing in playgrounds, going about your business, trying not to panic. This is the new reality, at least in those areas. Mines. Ukraine is now the most mined place in the world. Mines. I looked at that and I thought about how the enemy likes to mine the, the field. The field is the world. And how God's laborers, sometimes your job is just to go out and diffuse the mines before you can plant a harvest. Amen? Amen. You have to be very, very careful that you don't do something to destroy yourself or somebody else. They work full time out there trying to get rid of these mines. But if you see a sign like that, you, don't, you do not get off the road. In Snigarivka, where it was occupied by the Russians, some, a lot of the Russian soldiers either stayed behind as, you know, kind of like spies or they tried to stay behind to escape or whatever they were doing. But the Ukrainian army had to go through and clear every house. And that's a big, it's a big town. It's a very large town. Every gate, every door had either an X or an O on it. Our cross meant a positive threat, plus sign. That meant negative threat. And I looked at that, going down the road, and sometimes you saw this. I said, what does that mean? Well, there was a positive threat. Somebody probably died here. It was neutralized. And they told me stories. We sat across the, the table from people who fed us soup along the way, and, and uh, they said, yeah, we... Our neighbors left. We kept their house lit up so that the Russians wouldn't think that it was empty. So they didn't move in next door to us because we were their sport. They, were, they would just take people's uh, livestock, their cows, their, their goats, chickens, whatever. They would just blow them up. They would torture people. And, of course, the things that they do to women is unspeakable. There are things that I learned over there that would never, had never entered into my mind that a human being could do this to another human being, saved or lost. And um, so anyway, it was just a reminder to me of, you know, what if, what if the Lord went down your street? Would you be a positive threat to the devil's kingdom or would you be a big negative threat? <laughs> I thought about that. I thought about men like this, Sergei. This guy in the middle, that's his house. A lot of shrapnel. It took a lot of bomb, landed right, or a missile right about here, and it blew up. They blow up mostly like this, but it went out. And um, he was a guy that just said, you know what? He got saved, by the way. And he said, you know what? I'm nobody's enemy. I'm just neutral. I I'm not, you know, for Kiev or for Moscow. I just want to be left alone. I don't want to enter this war. And so since I'm nobody's enemy, I'm no threat to anybody. Everybody will love me, right? If I don't take a stand, if I don't draw lines, make a decision. And he said he found himself in the middle of a battle. He said, literally, he said, the, the Russians were over on that hill and the Ukrainians were over here. And he said, it was just kind of the rocket fire and all this stuff was going on. He said, me and my wife, we got down into the cellar and the bombs are going off and we waited for it to end. And then that one bomb almost hit the mouth of their cellar. And he said, he realized, and his wife was like, why didn't we get out now? You know, <laughs> you dummy. <laughs> why didn't we take a stand? You know, why didn't we leave and make a decision here? This is dangerous. But he, um, he stood there and he, you know, he said, well, when it ended, his wife went out while the Russians were still over there on the hill to make a phone call 
and he said it wasn't the Ukrainians, but it was the, a Russian sniper. Took a shot at her, and he said it literally grazed her head. He missed by just centimeters, millimeters, a fraction of an inch. That's, you know what that is? That's the grace of God. That's God's providence that they heard the gospel and got saved, and he finally figured out who the enemy is. I thought about God's people here. When are you going to figure out who the enemy really is? And it's not the brethren. Just, I thought about that. These flechettes, they're everywhere. They were everywhere, thousands and thousands of them everywhere. They're not supposed to be dropped on civilian populations, according to the Geneva Con Convention. All this stuff, like Tucker Carlson, oh, you know, the, the Russia's treating the prisoners of war with all this dignity and respect. It is a bunch of baloney. It's not true. But I, thought, I, looked at the, I looked at those things and I thought of those fiery darts of the wicked. It only, it only takes one. Those things are designed to break off. Those fletchings, they break off. It bends. It turns your insides to hamburger. Very dangerous. How important it is for us to have the shield of faith. Amen. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You better take that sword of the spirit and that shield of faith. It'll get you through some things. When's the last time you passed out tracks and it was like this? People getting help. Because you guys are holding the ropes. You need to hold this place together. You need to get your eyes in the bigger picture. Get it off yourself. Don't cause problems. Don't split the church. Keep loving the brethren. Keep serving the Lord. We're dependent on you. This doesn't happen if you guys fall apart. You understand? I look, at, I look at women like that and think, what if that was my grandma? I sure would want the Lord to send somebody her way. Love on her a little bit. She's poor. We went to this town. This was a new town, way, way up. The Russians occupied it. Most of these towns, the men are gone. They're dead. The women are all running things now. Got to preach to them. Seven people got saved. The war was just over there. Our van broke down. Praise God. <laughs> we had just had a great meeting, getting ready to go to the next one. It was early in the day. And um, we tried this, tried that, no, nothing, no response at all. I thought, well, it's a connection somewhere. We tried this. And finally, we, you know, I said this. I said, let's pray. It's like, duh, you know. <laughs> we tried all these things, and then we decided to pray, and I bowed my head, and oh, folks, I pled the blood, <laughs> did it all. Oh, God, we need your help, like right now, we're in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and we really need help, and in Jesus' name, amen. And about that time, this car, this one right here, was just going down the street, and he was on his way to a funeral. The graveyards are pretty full now. And uh, I'm just watching. About that time, Sasha was the one that, he was like, that's our answer to prayer. Man, he was out the, the door running down that mud road, you know, in the rain. And uh, we were able to get uh, this guy. He said, you know what, I'll put off the, the funeral. We'll help you out. So we loaded him up. And then the Lord sent another one. And we put a bumper sticker on him. And we loaded him up. And then we got another one. And we had an armada. Amen. Went to these places that were waiting for us and give them some aid, tell them Jesus loved them, amen, give them the gospel. This is where we spent the night. Usually I'd end up the, 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 the slides about here, but another church asked me to just keep going and add more. So I added more. These are just different snapshots. Oh, this is Snigarievka. They really just destroyed the infrastructure so they, so they could no longer function. As you go down the road, here's the mines. These are the trenches the Russians had dug in. You can see the burnt out trees where the, where the Ukrainians routed them, got them out of there. You can see all the patriots, their flags. That's where the men died. Uh, sometimes the Russians would booby trap the, the graves of the fallen soldiers before they left so that the families would suffer as well. These are the roads. You can see the bombed out, the trenches. You can see the trees that are all burned out. There was a lot of fighting that took place around here. I was worried about those folks that got saved like last year, and that fellow right there, his name is Sergei as well. And I was sitting across from him. I said, hey, brother, give us your testimony. He told how he got saved, how God called him to preach, and how he was in a different town altogether. 
And I'm worried about these new converts thinking, Lord, how are we going to, you know, get, disciple them? What are we going to do? Because I really feel like we, we're going in one direction. But I really think that over there in Gerson and in Mikolaev in that area, there's a lot. There's some great, great fertile ground. I think God is going to really do a great mo- work over there. And we want to help. <clears throat> Come to find out, he found out about those folks getting saved and there was no preacher. So he uprooted himself and he moved out there and he's discipling those folks now. Yeah, I'll tell his testimony. I said, so, well, how'd you get saved? He said, oh, my road to God was hard. He said, I was a typical Ukrainian male. I was out with some friends. We were, you know, kind of partying. And these Azerbaijanis, these Muslims, came and they were insulting our women and trying to abuse our women. And so we went over and beat them up. <laughs> we went over and left them up and made them leave. And then they came back. There was more of them and they had knives. And he said, one of them got me right in the spleen. And he was in the hospital between life and death. And he said a Baptist pastor came in. And the first, he said the first words out of his mouth was, young man, it wasn't how are you doing, what's your name, my name is. He said, young man, are you ready to be reconciled to God yet? <laughs> and he got saved. And then when we showed up in Snigorievka the second time, there was these, these ladies that were there that had gotten saved. And they wanted me to know they were saved. And, and then she, the one lady was like, did you bring us our pastor? Where's our pastor? I said, you got a pastor now? She said, yeah. Where's our pastor? It turns it's him. It's him. It's Sergei. That's a blessing, folks. That's just God working in the background. Amen. Doing what he needs to do. The shrapnel's everywhere. The casings are everywhere. Those are pretty big casings, by the way. I don't know if you can. That's not a 22, but <laughs> The minefields. This guy is actually demining the field by hand. And then the one town... I asked him, I said, you know, if you see a plowed field, that's safe to walk. If you see it that's got a bunch of weeds and stuff, that, you don't go there. You won't come back. This is all along the roads. More zeros. Bombed out infrastructure. Destruction. There's where the old chinko with the bread. There's Sergei. There's reminders of war everywhere. These are, these are, Rockets that didn't explode. That's called grace, by the way. You, know, you can see that the Ukrainians, they defused them. Here's the places where the Russians used to occupy, bombed out tanks. You, just, you drive by this stuff. In the middle of all the destruction, we passed this. That's a, called a salon. That's a beauty salon. That's where you get, your ladies get the, the cream and the paint and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, and the coffee, Amen. Coffee, kava right there, coffee. And I'm like, oh, in the middle of all this destruction, it's like the ladies, the show must go on. Amen. <laughs> ladies have to be ladies. I thought that was hilarious. I said, we, we have to take a picture of this. You know, so we turned back around, took a picture. They were very nice this time. They didn't feed us last time, and they got rebuked for it, so they fed us this time. And she was just, you could see the stress. She was asking, how can we get fresh water to our people, our town, where our, all of our wells and Cisterns, everything's polluted because the Russians, you know, destroyed that dam. We preached here. People got saved. These are just more pictures. They're just redundant after a while. This is one village where we preached. Could you imagine if that was your town? That's Russian liberation right there. Making people free from Nazis whenever the president's a Jew. <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's people that live here. You can see them on the street trying to put their houses back together, getting the bricks. Again, do you have any problems? Religion didn't help them. That icon, the good luck and that kind of stuff didn't help that house. preaching, doing what we can, ministering to the soldiers, houses, courtyards. That lady right there was a blessing. She got saved. She's like, I need a preacher. I need somebody to explain the gospel to me. Explain the Bible to me. I don't understand the Bible. I said, now that you're saved, I think you're going to find out it's going to be a little bit easier to understand the Bible. She went, oh. When's the last time a child of God, a saved person, had that kind of an emotional response to just understanding the scriptures? God's at work. 
that guy right there, PTSD, extreme PTSD, he's got the ticks. He's like, they killed my son. And I got one of their guns and I just started killing people. And he's, they need help. The reason why we take these kind of pictures is to prove, in case anybody tries to say that we're misappropriating funds, both here and there, that people see that the money is going where we said it was going to go. That just break your heart. When's the last time you saw that wanting to get literature? Anyway, we've gone long enough. I want to read a scripture. This has taken 43 minutes so far. And I'd like to just close with this. Thank you for your time this morning. Our plans are to... I believe that the Lord wants us to go back. I believe the Lord wants me to go back. He's given me scripture. Go back in, inside Ukraine. Uh, how long we'll be able to minister while we're there? I don't know. Am I against going outside of Ukraine? No, I'm not. But our plans and our intentions are to go back to get um, our paperwork and everything we need with our church. Uh, we're gonna con- our, our ministry and our plans have changed, of course, and we're just going to stay there where we are as long as we can, and I want to keep doing this. This is what I want to do. How long it's going to last, I don't know, but I know it won't last forever. Uh, we're trying to get men to help us out. You know, Brother Casey Klein is on board, and we've got other men, I think, that are, are, are beginning to see. Uh, their eyes are beginning to see what uh, the Lord's doing, because obviously, whenever I see God and, you know, the Holy Spirit touching a man that I don't even know and saying, hey, you need to go over here and disciple these people, I see that God wants to do something there. I think there's some churches there, and I especially think that Casey Klein's ministry is going to, he'll, he'll have an opportunity that will be great with, uh, like, circuit writing type preaching out there. And I want to help. I'm going to do my part and do what we can, keep my family safe, continue to operate. And um, we still need, you know, we, we have to, we, we have some things we need and some things that we have to do before I'll have the peace to be able to go back. But God provided for a vehicle. I didn't want to go back and like not have a way to get my family out if, in case things change dramatically. So we have a vehicle. Praise the Lord. Our church van is still broken down, but, you know, we, our family, we have a vehicle. And I just want to leave you with this thought. If you would open up Matthew chapter 9, and I'll turn it over to Pastor Elliot. Thank you again, brother, for allowing me on such short notice to come. Thank you for the, you know, the very generous love offering that you gave so that we could go do that on that scale. Amen. And... um, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye. Pray ye. Pray ye. For what? Pray for my job, pray for my insurance policy, pray for my, to get a new car, a new kitchen, or pray that, you know, for this, for that. Pray for what? Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And as far as I understand, that is the only recorded prayer request of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. We have prayer meetings, right, and prayer lists, and everybody puts their things on their list, right? The job and health and the kids and the parents and the relationships and all these things. And I just want to call, you know, call your attention to, hey, we need, some, we need Laodicea is blind because she looks at herself. Amen. Look at me, and I'm rich and increased with goods. And he says, you don't, know, you don't even know how the degree of your misery. You're poor, you're wretched, miserable, blind, and you're naked. I counsel thee. 
He's giving you some advice. Get your eyes off yourself. What about him? What are his prayer requests? What does he see? Could you just for a moment get your eyes off yourself and say, Lord, pray that God will send laborers. Those people need you. And God has just ordained that, that through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, folks. And so would you just please pray and be the kind of person, the kind of Christian that God will listen to. Get rid of all the blocks, all the hindrances to prayer. You take care of your, your junk, amen? <laughs> take care of your stuff. Be the Christian God wants you to be. And then, whenever all that's ready, and he, you know, we're ready to do business now, would you pray that God sends laborers into the harvest? Pray for the Lord's prayer request. Thank you, Amen. Pastor. Amen. 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 Let's get some uh, ushers up here real quick. Uh, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> Brother, I'm telling you what, man. Uh, you, it's not about just going to a place and, and uh, finding a place to go to and, and just, there's a need, there's a real need here. And uh, you, need to, you need to get that thing down. Uh, we're going to take him another offering tonight. Uh, he's going to be back tonight. He's going to be preached for us tonight. So if you don't have no money now and you want to give some later. I'll tell you what, brethren, there is a place. Sometimes putting your money uh, on something like that that gets done. Uh, there was a bunch of souls there that got saved that uh, we got an opportunity to be part of that. And, and uh, I tell you what, it's, that's where the excitement is. Coming to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night fun. Going out in the streets and jails are fun. But you go to a place like that right there. And I'm telling you, you go to some areas where people are hurting and they're looking for answers. And they don't, and they've done went through all this stuff and the bombs are going off and everything else. And you question why. Sometimes the hardest thing in your life is when troubles and trials come in and the tribulation of life. That, what, that brings you to a place where you start, everything goes off to the wayside and the lights are gone and you don't have roofs over your head. And all of a sudden you say, what, what's going on? And somebody comes in with an answer. And the Lord's done got in there and, and plowed up the ground and done all that stuff and got you at a place where you're asking. And then he said to somebody it. And then they take it. And like you said, 50 people come and get saved, and you wonder, did they really get saved? Hey, the offer was made, clear as you could possibly make it, and they responded. Well, somebody's been working. And over in Revelation, it talks about a door is open sometimes, and you don't know how long that door is going to be open. And what you do is you get involved in that door and right then and there before it gets past you. Uh, we've got way too much stuff in this country. And i got people mad at me because I say that, and I don't really care. We got way too much stuff, and it's blinding you. It's blinding us to what is really going on on this planet. And God's given you the ability to help in those things. Like he said, church, stay there because you get the ability to help that out. I knew one thing, that in the Navy, we had a supply system. We had buildings on the side of the ships. We had three, 400 ships sitting down, actually about 200, in Norfolk, Virginia, and we had the supply. It, it was just as important to have those people up there that managed all that supply and parts and everything else to get it down to the ship so we could go out to sea and do what we needed to do. If these people weren't up here, we couldn't have done that. It takes both sides to make this thing happen. They were just as important as any one of those ships. If they didn't send us the shells, if they didn't send us the missiles, if they didn't send us the food, the milk, and the supplies and everything else, we couldn't survive out there in the middle of the ocean. I'm telling you, brethren, it's, and, and you get the opportunity to sit back and you say, well, I get to work. Well, why are you working? To get a boat? To get a big house? To get a fancy car? Is that why you're working? I think you're working to help God and, and take care of your family needs. And take, but where's the excess at? Uh, we're going to take him an offering right now, give it to Brother Chris, and, and uh, we're going to still help him. I told him when he gets ready to go back, uh, and, and we may even have to go back with him. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just fun. I, that makes that's exciting, man. Okay, so you could die. And, and the worst thing that could possibly happen is you go to heaven. That's pretty bad. 
And you get to serve Jesus on the way out. Could you just imagine you go over there and you get all blown up. Now this is not going to sound morbid or anything. But you get all blown up and, and it only hurts for a couple seconds. And it's just like you see this big flash of light and you go away. And the next thing you know, you're looking at Jesus. And he goes, wasn't that cool? <laughs> you go, yeah, I don't, I don't remember if I felt anything. He goes, you probably felt it, but it didn't last very long. <laughs> he goes, that's the way to go out, man. And all through eternity, you get to tell your story how you got blown up at the last minute. And you're with Jesus. And you say, that's, that's morbid. No, but brother, I'm telling you what, he died on a cross for me. He shed his blood hanging there. Nails and spikes at him. And he hung there, and it wasn't quick. And it took him some time, and then he gave up the ghost, and he did that for me. And he goes, Mike, if you're going to rule with me and reign with me, you're going to suffer with me. And sometimes on this side of glory, we get the privilege to aid men like that to go over there. You know why I love Brother Chris? It's because he's still there after all these years and not quit. And still trying to find a way to still do something for Jesus. And he's still got feet on the ground and in contact. You know what you can do is help him. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. I do pray that you'd bless this offering. Uh, Lord, help us to help him uh, help you. Lord, what a blessing it is just to be able to know you and what you've done for us. Help us to always do it for someone else. Father, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. until tonight. We'll be back at 6 and Brother Chris will finish it off. Amen. Father, thank you for your blessings today. Again, bless the afternoon. Bring us back safely and we'll praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.